Hello, BookTube. I've got some mail for you today on the first day of October. Let's see how we start off the new month. Uh, and we will concentrate also, We'll I'll try to remember to talk about these a little in terms of uh, the professional aspect of it, the professional side of forthcoming books, because these, those of you who are new to this channel, these will be new and forthcoming books. They won't be, they won't be anything else. Uh, and also for those of you who are new to my channel, I, I have a vested interest in the professional side of getting books in the mail, uh, because I am and have been for a long time, a book section editor, including nowadays a book section editor for a print newspaper, not the book's coverage of an art section, but actual dedicated book pages. That is extremely rare. There are almost no small town or local little newspapers that do that at all. They all used to. Once upon a time, they always, it was a mark of pride to have a, a books page. But now virtually none of them do. And so those editorships have folded into larger editorships. So the arts and entertainment section will have a few editors, and one of them will be nominally called a, book section editor, a books editor, but there'll be four book reviews a year or even four book reviews a month. They won't be uh, for a tiny little newspaper in northern Georgia. We come out once a month, Big Canoe News. I am the book section editor. I might be the smallest player at the table, but I am still I still legitimately earn the place at the table. In addition to that, I'm also one of the editors in an online literary journal, Open Letters Review, uh, which is small but respected. Malashi, thanks to the heft of our masthead, we punch above our weight, we get blurbed on books. Um, and in addition to that, I'm also a working book editor or book reviewer. So I, I have an interest, a vest, as apart from being interested in books just in general, I have a vested interest in, in new releases. Before we get to the new releases, we have some uh, periodicals. What do we have here? We have the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, where uh, one of the places where I am uh, a book reviewer. Uh, a broadsheet newspaper for the island of Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, in the on season, Martha's Vineyard is a vacation resort. Uh, so now it has become largely a vacation resort. So in the summer, in the on season, uh, it will be one of the small town local newspapers in the country with the highest number of multimillionaire readers. Because <laughs> when you're on the Vineyard, especially if you're there for the whole summer, you're going to get the Vineyard Gazette and you're going to read it. It's And, and so uh, that editor, the, the managing editor... Uh, he has decisions of his own to to decide for uh, his book's coverage. And for him, it's all local. Uh, so that's what I do. The, author, the book either has to be about the vineyard or it has to be by a vineyarder or somebody who spends a significant amount of time there. Whereas for my own very, very small book section, I don't do it that way. I don't do just Georgia books or Georgia authors at all. I do new releases just in general. So that, But that's always it's always fun to read. I doubt that I will ever set foot on Martha's Vineyard again. So it's it's extra fun to read all the doings of, of, of uh, all the various towns. Then we have uh, the National Review. This is a, a right-wing magazine, but not necessarily fully fascist. They don't particularly like Donald Trump. They don't particularly like MAGA. Uh, but uh, they do often take things too far. Uh, Kamala Harris, for instance, this cover is called the Cardboard Campaign. She's not a cardboard candidate at all. And the the article that writes about this is almost certainly going to gloss over the fact that the Republican candidate is out of his effing mind. He's uh, he's literally insane. And also rancid with racism. I mean, his racism in the last two weeks has been so appallingly petty and rancid and acidic that I find it hard to believe that even the normal racists who make up his his base don't find it a little bit too uncomfortable to applaud. The, he, he said all weekend long, this, this past weekend, all weekend long, he, he said one absolutely certifiably insane thing after another. Uh, and promised over and over again at a couple of different points in a couple of different speeches that he, he intends to rescind the rule of law. If he returns to power, he will fundamentally change the United States. It will be that he is a, a crime boss and the level of violence that you receive in connection with that will be entirely up to you. What are you willing to pay and how white is your skin? 
uh, the virtual promises to that effect are now in every single rambling, slurred speech that he gives. But also other things, uh, two of them have gone viral, and uh, they should go viral, of course. But the talking heads, the cable news talking heads that have talked about these two things for the Republican candidate uh, haven't been, ra they themselves have not been racist enough to even understand what he was saying. They aren't, they aren't stooping low enough. They never have to read him. They absolutely, fundamentally do not believe that their doors are going to be kicked in in January. They do not believe that they and their children are going to be incarcerated for not liking this guy. They fundamentally do not believe that. And that astonishes me. I don't know what more he needs to do to convince those people. I don't know what, how much clearer the parallels to, to 1930s Germany need to be. I, Donald Trump has a list. It is meticulously upkept by him and others, but he's the one who generates the, the, the broad shape of it. And the things you need to do to get on the top of that list, you might think his most relentless critics need will be on the top of that list. But no, it, well, his critics are on that list, but it, it, it's a specific kind of critic. It's the ones who, who go after his money. It's the ones who earn prizes for going after his money. And it's also the New Yorkers. So you have late night comedians He's mentioned Jimmy Kimmel by name a number of times when he should be campaigning for president. He's mentioned Jimmy Kimmel a number of times. Jimmy Kimmel's name is on that list, but it's way, way below David K. Johnson, or especially Keith Olbermann. There's a, and, and the people that are on that list, I, I think Michael Cohen might be the only one I've heard, maybe Mitt Romney, who have said, who have, who have thought about and actually are starting to plan what they will do how they will leave this country before the gates swing closed in front of them. But the other members of the commentary, no. They claim that it's a dictatorship that's right on the edge of happening. They don't act that way. Rachel Maddow has not made any plans to live somewhere else, to leave the country, to flee the country with her loved ones and all sorts of portable wealth. She has not made any plans to do that. She fundamentally does not believe that will happen. Uh and that's because they're underestimating him, and they underestimated his racism as well. I might as well say, I'm on down on the rabbit hole, I might as well. One of the weird things he said was that the super immigrants that Kamala Harris is inviting into the country are smarter than, than normal because they have apps to guide them, and most people don't know what a phone app is. Uh, and everybody's been laughing at him because it's, it, the, the wording, the precise wording of what he says is that no one knows what a phone app is. When that's not what he was saying. In the context of his comment, you would think that, and that's funny, and you would go for that. But the reason you would think that is because you're not a racist. Nowhere near as much of a racist as he is. What he was saying is, they don't understand apps. These dirty brown people don't understand apps. It's the super smart ones of them that apparently understand apps when they don't usually. It's not nobody understands phone apps. It's nobody of them understands phone apps and if you're not looking for that level of racism, you won't see it. You just won't see it. It's been gone from the world for 70 years, so you just won't see it. Same thing with the other viral moment. He was giving a speech at one of his Klan rallies about how one of, about the, the sale of his Nazi armbands is doing really well and interrupted that boring uh, anecdote uh, to mention that a fly was on the podium. That he was, oh, there's a fly up here. And then he said, I wonder why. And then he said, there wouldn't have been a fly up here two years ago. And the commentariat has said, I wonder why. Oh, so he thinks the fly is a spy for the Biden-Kamala Harris campaign. Oh, so he's that paranoid. And what is he talking about saying that, that, that he wasn't running for president two years ago? Because they're not racist enough to realize what he was really saying, which is that this place is fly-blown because of the immigrants, because the dirty brown people brought dust and dirt and flies with them. I wonder why there's a fly up here now. Wouldn't have been here two years ago. Uh, and that's a candidate for president of the United States. That's the other guy. So when, when the National Review starts talking about how Kamala Harris is a cardboard campaign, 
I realize they're the faithful opposition and you've got a line to tread, but what's the alternative? What's the alternative? You ran a never Trump issue. He's going to kill you all. So, so what is... <sighs> anyway, anyway, the other periodical is the uh, New York Review of Books, uh, which has uh, a lot of interesting things in the table of contents, but there were a couple of things that caught my attention. <laughs> One in particular that caught my attention. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, somebody reviews The Blue Machine, a History of How the Ocean Works, which I got and I haven't read. Uh, and there's also a review of, uh, yeah, Times Echo by Jeremy Eichler. That, that I, the book seems interesting to me. I'll be interested in the review. But there's also a review uh, of the Oxford Handbook of Daniel Defoe, which I will definitely read, but I want that book. <laughs> I want that book. Uh, the Oxford Handbooks are big. 100 plus dollar hardcover collections of the latest in essays on all of all kinds on the subject matter. They're amazing. There must be 200 of them by now. And they're incredibly good. Just endlessly thought provoking. And Daniel Defoe is amazingly interesting. He, we, people, people just, they encounter him once in high school and they tend to write him off, but his life is utterly fascinating. I would like the Oxford Handbook of Daniel Defoe. I don't know if I'll if I'll get off the gumption to ask for it. Uh, but anyway, let's let's look at the uh, at the eleven minute mark. Let's look at the mail uh, and see what we have here to get us through. Of course, it's the first of October, so I I just recently engaged in the very melancholy process, a very melancholy process of uh, rearranging my work books, my so called work books, uh, the new copies and the galley copies. I arrange them on a bookcase month by month. At the end of every month, I move everything up. I disperse the current month, and I move everything up to the, uh, one shelf. Of course, at the beginning, for most of the year, you're moving everything up shelf by shelf. But now, you're moving everything up shelf by shelf, and there's barely anything down below because the new year has yet to launch. Uh, so I moved up, I moved up all the books to put the October books up on that top shelf, and I moved up November. So I'm hoping all of these things are November copies. Uh, what have we got here? All right, well, this is October 29th, so that's close enough. Uh, this is by Jason Steffen, and it is called Hidden in the Heavens. Looks like popular astronomy, which I love. How the Kepler mission's quest for new planets changed the way we view our own. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, in this book, the author, a former scientist on NASA's Kepler missions, describes how that mission searched for planets orbiting sun-like stars, especially Earth-like planets circling in Earth-like orbits. What the Kepler Space Telescope found, he reports, contradicts centuries of uh, theoretical and observational work and transformed our understanding of planets, planetary systems, and the stars they orbit. Kepler discovered thousands of planets orbiting distant stars, a bewildering variety of celestial bodies, including rocky planets being vaporized by the intense heat of their host star, super-Earths, and sub-Neptunes, with properties simultaneously similar to and different from both Earth and Neptune. Gas giants several times in the size and mass of Jupiter, the planets orbiting in stellar systems that have only been imagined in science fiction. The author offers a unique inside account of the work of the Kepler science team, mapping the progress of the mission from the launch of the rocket that carried Kepler into space to the revelations of the data that began to flow to the supercomputer back at NASA. Oh, oh my. Okay, fantastic. All right, that comes out in late October. I'm all over it. Uh, fantastic. All right, so uh, I don't know how many astronomy fans are out there. I, I very seldom meet other astronomy fans, people who, who log on to the live feed from the space station or whatnot. I, I think... I think that's a generational thing. Once upon a time, when I was your age, <laughs> there were a lot more space fans than there are now. I don't know why that is. Uh, but let's see here. Let's see what this next one is. Uh, okay, this is a, a Christmas book, but I bet it doesn't come out at Christmas. No, this comes out uh, in uh, October 15th. This is by James Murray and Darren Wearmouth, and it is called You Better Watch Out. A thriller. Uh, a suspenseful serial killer thriller that leaves you wondering, is Christmas really the best time of year? Well, you could come up with a better name than Me Kill Now, I think. Uh, 
48 hours until Christmas, Jessica Kane wakes up with blurred vision, ears ringing, and in excruciating pain. A gash in her head and blood running down her face, the last thing she remembers is going for a run and something or someone hitting her in the head. It doesn't take her long to realize she's trapped in an unknown, deserted town with five other strangers who share similar stories of being attacked and stranded here. Unsure how they got here, she knows one thing for certain. She has to find a way out. That becomes nearly impossible when someone is meticulously orchestrating their deaths, one by one, and the only thing Jessica can do is watch the life leave their eyes. The fenced-in town is the killer's own playground, and there's nowhere left to hide. Okay, all right, that sounds really good. <laughs> that sounds really, really good. <laughs> okay, so this comes out on October 15th. It is October 1st. I think I'm well within my rights to read that tonight. I think so. I think I will uh, I'll pop that down tonight. It's it's 150 pages, so it won't, won't be much of uh, an expenditure. It won't cut into anything else. How I wish it were cutting into the Oxford Handbook of Daniel Defoe. Uh, I, would, I would devote the whole night to the Oxford Handbook of Daniel Defoe. Now, this next one is tiny. It's wafer thin. So it could be a slim volume of poetry. I get slim volumes of poetry. Uh... Yes, it is. Oh, it's. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not. Uh, let's get this straight. Uh, it is not a slim volume of poetry. It's a single poem. New and Collected Hell by Shane McRae. A poem. One poem. Uh, do you want to tell me how long you are? No? 80 pages. Uh, so let's see what we have here. Although, <laughs> again, keep in mind... The pub sheet for contemporary poetry. What is the publicist supposed to do? <laughs> what, they, what can they possibly write for contemporary poetry? Uh, especially one poem. Good Lord. Uh, coming after McRae's two previous collections, The Book of Poetry, The Many Hundreds of the Scent, and the memoir, Pulling the Chariot of the Sun, for which he was profiled in the New York Times Magazine and appeared on NPR, this book, his new collection, returns and renews his body of work. Okay, well, is it new? Is it a collection or is it one poem? It says it's one poem. Uh, McRae's Hell is new and collected because it brings together a poet's older poem on the subject and adds to it, building it into a book-length epic. Here is a poet at his darkest and at the height of his powers. His poetry has always been praised for its prophetic, powerful voice of... Okay, all right, we got a few, uh, some people praising him. Okay, now he turns his vision toward that subject, which is the perennial draw of oracular poets since Dante. Hell. Name one other than Dante. Uh, here, McCrae plums its depths and interrogates its denizens, bizarre lakes and massive inquisitorial birds, the burning edge of heaven and the tyrant beetle. It is a stark, though often humorous, representation of eternal, infernal place, one that calls back to Milton and Dante while being fantastically modern, a version of the afterlife for our lives, a vision of hell for our time. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, well, these things no longer present to me the terror they once did, because I have a poetry guy, <laughs> so I will just add this to the pile. I, I tend to do that. If I were being a really conscientious editor, I would pop each one of these tiny little things into an envelope and fly them off to his address. But I let them accumulate. I mean, when does this come out? Uh, February. I, I let them accumulate. <laughs> They're such tiny little things. Why waste the postage? I'll give him a nice little package of, of these slim volumes of poetry. They, they, they set his little heart a pitter-pattering. So he's the perfect guy. I found the perfect guy for it. Uh, let's see here. What is this next one? Now, this one is not finished, so this one... Oh, very good. Okay. This is from the wonderful folks at Basic Books. Uh, this is coming out next year. Uh, but when I saw it in a catalog, I started squealing for it like a newborn piggy. <laughs> and they, they very nicely humored me by sending me a copy a little early. <laughs> this is by Josiah Osgood, uh, who we have seen before writing in, about the classical world. And this is Lawless Republic. The Rise of Cicero and the Decline of Rome, from the folks at Basic Books. In contrast to the often procedural, bureaucratic processes of today, criminal trials in Rome served as forms of public entertainment, drawing large crowds to the forum where the most powerful members of the society faced accusations of murder, election bribery, and extortion. 
Amid the drama and spectacle arose Rome's greatest criminal defense lawyer, Marcus Tullius Cicero, a man from a modest background but with acute storytelling and rhetorical skills that allowed him to climb the political ladder and eventually hold the Roman Republic's top office of consul in 63 BC. But across almost four decades of Cicero's career, the rising threat of political violence overshadowed Rome's greatest cultural achievements, culminating in the assassination of Julius Caesar and the downfall of the Republic. No. No. <laughs> it culminated in Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon and killing the Republic by seeming dictatorial powers. It didn't culminate with him dying. It isn't a dream of his that died in Dealey Plaza. It culminated with him destroying the Republic that gave him everything. Uh, but anyway, the downfall of the Republic was already gone. So what, it wasn't his assassination and the downfall of the Republic here. And also, I might, I might point out here that we have ample evidence that Cicero was not all that good at the kind of public spectacle that, law, that trials often were in Rome. We have ample evidence to, to that effect that, that a lot of uh, the advocates in ancient Rome, whose names we know, whose memoirs unfortunately we don't have, were better at it than Cicero was. Uh, but still, this is, uh, doesn't sound, it sounds like it's not quite a, a biography of Cicero. It, instead, something else, something intriguing. Uh, in this book, the author recreates Cicero's greatest cases and the theatricality of the Roman courts to uncover what holds up the rule of law, what threatens it, and what happens when the law gives way to disorder. Oh, oh so this is going to be about Cicero's time in, as an advocate, mostly. His time as a lawyer. Oh, interesting. How utterly interesting. You know, what When law gives way to disorder, so that would be uh, an, an example of that, for instance, would be that if you had certain men who were accused of conspiring as, in a coup against the country, you would execute them out of hand. You wouldn't put them on trial. Is that uh, what, what, what happens when law gives way to disorder? I wonder who gave that order. Hmm. Uh, beginning with Cicero's rise to prominence as a trial lawyer, Osgood illustrates the defining moments of this extraordinary career, including Cicero's defense of a man accused of patricide, his prosecution of a Sicilian governor who allegedly put Romans to death, and his suppression of the Catalinian conspiracy, a necessary action to restore the rule of law in Rome. What, did Cicero write this? <laughs> uh, but one that invited criticism from his opponents for infringing on citizens' liberties. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you kill somebody, you've kind of infringed on the liberties. <laughs> Through Cicero's cases, this book examines questions that pertain to any democracy, ancient or contemporary. How to restore the rule of law after an outbreak of violence. How to hold public officials who abuse their power accountable and whether voters or jurors should decide a politician's fate. This book shows how Cicero won his cases. It also shines a light on how political violence is fueled by glaring inequality among citizens and unscrupulous leaders exploiting that gap, a cautionary tale for parallels, with parallels to today's news headlines. Well, here's hoping he doesn't do much on the ripped from today's headlines business. This is interesting enough on its own. Uh, well, okay. Uh, that is that is fast. That is absolutely fascinating. Uh, there aren't there haven't been many books in 2024 that have tempted me. Again, those of you who are new, or well, those of you who have been with me for thousands and thousands of videos, this is all just a broken record to you. But there are new people here, as I'm constantly told. Some of you tell me every day how many new people are here. <laughs> the number does not appear to be going in the right direction. <laughs> uh, but for the for the new people here, uh. Uh, I I end my year at the end of the year. I, I don't cross over anything from one year to the next. So I don't make any reading plans for 2025. I don't do anything like that. Uh, and I wind up all of my new release reading in mid-December. And every year there are a couple of books that tempt me. to. Every year I read a couple of the next year's books that year because I simply can't wait. And I don't know what I'll be doing the next year. So I don't want to just store it up and, and, and trust a momentum or whatever. And this is strongly tempting me. There haven't been many in 2024 that have strongly tempted me, but that one is uh, just to see what this author, who I like. Oh, did we mention what the author did? What has the author written? He's a professor of classics at Georgetown University, holds a PhD from Rome. And he's the author of six books on Roman history. Uh, he translated a 2020 edition of Suetonius's Life of the Caesars, but 
what are the books? Because all they're mentioning is is. Uh, Hmm. Oh no, they don't. They don't list them at all. Well, this advanced copy is not going to do that. Uh, but he's done things that that aren't mentioned in that bio that I really like. Uh, so, and what he makes of Cicero, that is always going to be interesting. Uh, I guess I would. I would kind of prefer it if it were a. If it were a big full dress biography, I guess I would kind of prefer that. But uh, maybe maybe it's going to come close enough. And I don't know that there is one in the works for. Uh, all of next year so it could be this is I, this is all i'm gonna get uh so what is this next one i got an invoice not a pub sheet uh so we're just gonna have to read about this thing in the book itself what is this this is from the great folks at princeton oh, this comes out in february this is by kenneth catania and it's called on the art and craft of doing science okay well i, I I love the, the title. A lot of thing, a thing that a lot of people don't realize if they don't if they don't look into these things is that science is very much a verb. It's very much a process, not not a thing. Uh, let, let's see what we have here, though. Like any creative endeavor, science can be messy and chaotic. This book shares the creative process of an innovative and accomplished scientist taking readers behind the scenes of some of his most pioneering investigations and explaining why the practice of science, far from being an orderly exercise in pure logic is a form of creative expression like any other. Okay, please tell me that the pioneering scientist is not you, Kenneth Catania. <laughs> please tell me it's not you. Uh, Kenneth Catania begins by discussing how ideas set the stage for scientific breakthroughs and goes on to describe ways of approaching experimental design. He sheds light on the importance of art in making discoveries and demonstrates how to find and tell a compelling story about a scientific result while accurately communicating its findings. What role does science, well, science, scientists mostly don't do that anymore. The, luckily, a whole shrubbery of the subcategory of science explainers and popularizers has sprung up. They do a great job. Scientists almost never do. When's the last scientific paper that you read that was interesting reading? I, I, it's absurd even to talk about it. I, I read, I do my share of them, and they're, they're barely English, so... Uh, what role does failure play in science? Is it possible to fail better? How do you define success in science? The author provides insights to these and other questions, along the way sharing the lessons he's learned from diverse figures ranging from science philosopher Thomas Kuhn to novelist Stephen King. Oh my God, it is all about him. Oh my God. Uh, okay, well then we probably should find out who he is, shouldn't we? He is the Stevenson Professor of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University. He's a MacArthur Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow, and he's written a bunch of other books. Okay. Uh, I don't know his name. And if you're going to write a book about, uh, what was it, an innovative and accomplished scientist, I'd better know his name, and so would you. And I don't. So, <laughs> but this doesn't come out until next year, so I don't have to worry about it. But I like it. I like the idea of it. I will do this last one, and we'll be done. Uh, with the mail for today. A nice, bright, brassy, hot and humid uh, typical autumn day here in October. What is this next? Oh, oh, this is big. Oh my, for some reason I just blanked on the page count of this thing. This is almost 700 pages. Oh my. Uh, okay, this is the new James Holland. Uh, World War II historian that I really like. I liked him a lot. I viewed his books. I blurbed on his books. Uh, and then uh, David Murphy, uh, late of BookTube fame. Once upon a time, you knew people years and years ago, there was a very, very nerdy BookTuber named David Murphy. <laughs> he was, uh, uh, especially his World War II and economics. So interesting and not. <laughs> and, and he could, at the drop of a hat, talk at enormous length about either one of them. Uh, and he, he and... He fell into my clutches. He became a friend of mine, unfortunately. <laughs> so I feel sorry for people who do, but nevertheless, uh, in correspondence, he made it clear, and also on his channel, uh, I hate I hate to tell you that he nuked most of his videos, so you can't go and see what I'm talking about. Uh, but in his videos and then in conversation, he, he I saw that his estimate of James Holland, it wasn't starry-eyed or anything, but it was higher than mine. Uh, so I went back. And, and reread a lot of this author, and it turns out that was entirely right. There was a lot of 
nuance there that I had missed. So uh, he's now he's now an author that I really look for when he writes a new book. And this is his new book, Casino 44, The Brutal Battle for Rome. We got the advanced copy of this, but this thing's whomping big. That's great. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh, this is based on two decades of research. It's going to be a $35 hardcover, 672 pages. Comes out on the middle of November. So that's good. I finally did get a November fish copy. It, was, it took a long time, but I finally did. Uh, this is a masterful, much-awaited volume that vividly evokes the dramatic last months of the Italian campaign and brings new awareness to this vital hinge point of the war. As the new year of 1944 began, the Allied Army's momentum had ground to a halt just south of the vaunted German Gustav line of defense, far short of their initial objective of liberating Rome by Christmas. The fighting up in the Italian peninsula had been brutal, with rugged terrain, fierce resistance, and terrible weather. Yeah, right. Rugged terrain, fierce resistance, terrible weather. You're leaving out something, but I guess you're talking about uh, the forces facing the Allies. <laughs> the main problem was in the Allies. <laughs> but, uh, while Allied leaders in London prepared for the cross-channel invasion of France later that spring, the war in the West hinged on Italy. Uh, as the author relates in this book, the next five months saw two of World War II's most famous battles, the four ferocious assaults on Monte Cassino and the fraught landing northwest of the marshes of Anzio, culminating at last in the liberation of Rome on June 4, a mere two days before D-Day. Based on 20 years of research, this book offers perspectives and conclusions differing from the standard narrative. Fantastic. Okay. All right. That is terrific. Uh... So, what does his bio say? Uh, uh, one of World War II's finest historians. That's the part that I didn't that I didn't really get. I didn't really think that. If you add the word living to that, then thanks to David Murphy, I now do see that. Uh, this author is the author of The Savage Storm, Brothers in Arms, Sicily 43, Normandy 44, The Big Week, The Rise of Germany, The Allies Strike Back, World in, in the War of the West Trilogy and dam busters so the the uh the rise of germany and the allies strike back are well, volumes one and volume two in the war in the west trilogy and like everybody else i think you kind of hope that the next big book is going to be the third book in that trilogy uh but this will certainly do <laughs> this will certainly do boy oh boy i'll tell you one thing i sure am glad that David Murphy isn't here to snap this book up and stick it in his luggage, or I'd never see it again. <laughs> so, so there you go. So, so uh, that's the mail. Not a bad mail haul. We have Casino Forty Four, big tome of a thing. We have the art and science of the art and craft of doing science. Uh, we have Lawless Republic about the legal career of Cicero. Uh, we have New and Collected Hell. So I gather this author wrote a poem called Hell, long poem called Hell, and here he's either revising it or he's including his first draft and then a new draft. I will let my poetry guy sort it out. <laughs> uh, you'd better watch out, uh, which is as a you me kill now title, but that premise sounds really, really good. And then finally, Hidden in the Heavens, about the Kepler's telescope, but the, the, the incredible exoplanet discoveries of Kepler. Uh so that's, that's not a bad mail haul. And apart from the slim poetry volume, which I don't need to think about, no fiction. <laughs> it's just, just right. <laughs> it's just the kind of balance I like. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Uh, although, when it comes to fiction, I should point out, that book, Lawless Empire, the, that book, of, or Lawless Republic, whatever it is, what's it called? Lawless Republic. Uh, looks like the author is going to concentrate on Cicero's legal career. And maybe go case by case. Now, Cicero wrote up these things, and they have been the subject of endless analysis and, and uh, history from classical historians. And that's great. And you can, you can find breakdowns of all of those, the backstories of all of those famous trials, all of them. Um, but they are also magnificently done by Stephen Saylor in his Roma Sub Rosa series of Roman murder mysteries. For a while there, at the beginning of his Gordianus the Finder books, he thought it might be a good idea, while Cicero was a rising man and getting, well, Cicero was coming to know Gordianus, his main character, uh, if maybe he just made murder mysteries out of some of those Ciceronian murder trials. And he does a wonderful job. I don't agree with almost anything that he reconstructs. And eventually he leaves that behind. 
goes to the Catalan conspiracy and then much, much bigger things, uh, Caesar and the destruction of the Republic. And Gordianus and his, his various family members are involved in all of that. But some of those early volumes, like Roman Blood, the first Gordianus book, starts with Gordianus in his overgrown garden when there's a knock at the door and it is it is Tyro uh the young the young assistant that Cicero kept with him always to the bitter end uh coming as an emissary from the great man himself so in addition to that book I also strongly recommend that series <laughs> but anyway uh, I'm gonna wrap this up for now it's gone on quite long enough but I'll be back thank you book two